Hello, and welcome everyone to today's Association for Manufacturing Excellence webinar titled Systematic Layout Planning, or SLP. I am Jerry Strohmeyer, the Education and Training Program Coordinator for AME, and I will be your moderator. Today's presenter is David Hess, Principal of Dr. Lean LLC. Dave has worked as a Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or MEP, project manager with manufacturers to improve their quality, efficiency, and profitability. He brings over 32 years of hands-on operations experience and has focused on implementing world-class manufacturing concepts in the aluminum extrusion, aerospace, and steel foundry industries. Dave is a NIST MEP certified lean trainer and has conducted workshops, train the trainer seminars, and lean implementations both here and abroad. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. You will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. You will see that you are muted on your attendee panel on the right side of your screen. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them into your question area in the attendee panel and click on Submit. We'll review the questions at the end of today's presentation and answer as many as we can. When you log off today, please check your email inbox. In it will be an invitation to fill out a short webinar attendee survey. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey today as your feedback is very important to us to improve future webinars. Dave has also graciously agreed to provide a PDF of today's presentation. We will be sending that along with a recorded link for a webinar replay to each of you this week. Now I am pleased to introduce Dave Hess, who will present Systematic Layout Planning. Take it away, Dave. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. Um, on this very first slide, I want to point out something about systematic layout planning. This program was copyrighted by uh, Professor or Dr. Richard Muther and Associates, the University of Kansas, back in the 50s. Uh, most recently, they've licensed a group down in Marietta, Georgia, with, with the title Richard Muther and Associates, and uh, they they are the primary holder of this of this product, if you will. So today, what we're going to do is just give you uh, an overview of this thing called systematic layout planning. And uh, without getting too um, wordy here, this this technique is is an approach that uses real data. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that in all of your operations, you have processes. And those processes are speaking to you. But without some way of translating that language, you, you're not listening. You're not hearing. So this methodology takes real data from your processes and lets you use that to align your facilities, your operations, material flows, and so on and so forth. And it aligns them without opinions. So let me talk a little bit about that second bullet, takes opinions out of the decision making. Most recently, we had a company um, send five people from down south up to one of our facilities up here in the northeast because the outfit down in the south was struggling for four months to get a layout done using opinions. Everybody had a different opinion. So they were constantly moving little paper dolls around the plant layout and never getting a good, solid decision that anybody could agree to. So bottom line is, what, why do you want to use this systematic layout planning? First of all, it does is it takes what I call uh, doing layout in a silo. It takes out the paper doll thing. It 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 it, it doesn't have this little one, two, three person team moving things around because what will happen is number two. If you're playing, uh, if you're playing moves in a silo, you could be making, uh, you could be playing like a one move chess game. After you make the move and nail it down, 
you might be very sorry. And you might have caused a real costly um, mistake in your facility. Not a good thing. So bottom line is getting a good layout requires a good approach. It's listening to the data that your processes is giving you, listening to the language, and then allows you to examine a number of different alternatives okay? and do that by considering a bunch of factors that you and your team agree to. So there's a there's a bunch of things, and this this next two slides is a little wordy. Um, so I'll I'll really kind of touch on uh, a few of these things here. First of all, how, however you lay out your facility is going to have a, an impact on operating costs, obviously, and profitability. You also have to be confronted by safety laws and, and OSHA laws and, and various regulations. But more, most importantly, when you lay out a facility, you're laying out a lot of money. You, you are, you're setting up a, uh, a facility with a lot of high capital costs. And you want to get it right. You want to get it right, right? Because it's going to be there for the long term. You're not going to be changing it next week and then the following week. Um, this plan planning and laying out to what your process is telling you will help you get good product flow, uh, fewer disruptions in the production flow, better on-time delivery, quality should be better because you're going to be designing that in, your employees will be much better suited to what you're asking them to do. Also, this process has a, a, a means of building in anticipated requirements. In other words, okay, we have a department right now with 100 square feet. Uh, within the next five years, we're going to need 200 square feet. So this allows you to, to, to build this in um, to, to, as number 10 says, to take advantage of uh, a business opportunity or what have you. Um, also, with this planning method, it, it's as, as as its name, systematic, and will give you a good package for presenting to the financial people to uh, get the capital required to do the job. And it 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 really produces a facility that will handle not just today's situations, but growth situations. So now let's start talking about what do we need to do to make this happen. And before I really get started on this, I just want to make, make one point that when you come out of this webinar, there's going to be no way, shape, and form you're, you're going to be uh, an expert but at least you know what this process is all about. And I will give you resources where you're going to be able to go to those resources and, and get the needed help to do this. First thing that you're going to need, like in any factory situation, factory layout situation, uh, building of um, capacity, if you will, you're going to need some key information about the process. And you'll notice up at the top it says PQRST. And if you look at the left-hand column and go down, I've listed PQRST. And so what are we talking about in terms of product? We're talking about the material, the, the, the thing that's being worked on, the thing that's being produce the thing that's going to be distributed to the customer. Second thing is, how much? What's the volume? What's the volume and how much space do we need to handle it? Thirdly, we got to know the routing. 
what what does what is the process sequence? What does it look like? And how will the material go through that process? Along the way, you're going to need various supporting services, things that will need to be done to the product on the way, such as burn-in, or in the case of metal products, maybe heat treating, and so on and so forth. So supporting services that will back up and make the process, if you will. And last but not least, the timing. The timing. When and how long. You notice in the last column, column I, I have the word seasonal. Uh, I can think of a company that I've, I've worked with that makes uh, a motorized awning. Well, up here in New England, in the middle of February, you don't really need a motorized awning. But in the middle of July or August, they sell well. So seasonal timing, cutoff times, various things that have to do with what does the, the process, how does the process uh, move, if you will. Now this slide is very important. This is a very important slide because what it does is it gives you the three fundamentals of SLP. And it also gives you the fundamentals of something else that could be just mentioned at this point, um, SSLP, Simplified Systematic Layout Planning. And I'll, I'll mention to you further out uh, just what the difference between that is. But first, the first bullet is the relationships between activities. The relationships between activities, de depending on how you're going to drive this, is the flow, material flow driver. That's the material flow driver. Relationships between activities. The second fundamental is how much space for each activity is required. OK, today we have x. Tomorrow, it doesn't appear that we're going to be doing too much of that. We're going to probably we're going to be phasing this out or phasing it down, so maybe we're going to have a space X minus. Or are we going to see a large increase in this particular requirement, space requirement? So it could be larger. And then, last but certainly not least, once you've got the relationships and the space all nailed down, there may be some need to make adjustments to the final layout because a particular area uh, is of a certain size, shape, and dimension, and it's really not feasible to change that. So we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to deal with that in our uh, a lay a final layout. So there may be, and there probably will be, and there should be multiple. Uh, alternatives looked at when you make your final adjustments to the to the layout plan. So let me back up one slide and say the three fundamentals of SLP are relationship, space, and adjustments. Now there are basically four phases of SLP. The first one is the location. And of course, that that kind of is is a is a basic move. Okay, we got a brand new plant. That's the location. Okay, now the three the three um, things that we're going to do to get the layout is we're going to look at what kind of layout are we dealing with? Are we dealing with a, a small lot size job shop situation? Are we dealing with a batch size? Um, maybe driven by a heat treat furnace or or a heat treating line what have you uh, are we are we dealing with an assembly line and or continuous flow like in food or chemical industries and last but not least after you've got your location your arrangements or or your relationships and your arrangements and, and your various alternatives all you've got there is 
what it looks like and where it's going. Now you've got to go inside each box and do the detailed arrangement of where the various pieces of equipment are going to be placed. And once you have the detailed of where pieces of equipment are going to go, the next and final step is actually making it happen. Getting the riggers in, getting your mechanics and electricians to, to drop airlines, to drop uh, electrical lines, and so on and so forth, and doing the final installation. So four phases of it. I'm going to show you two diagrams right now, a little bit of redundancy, um, but I think they support each other a little bit, okay? First of all, on the left-hand side of this repeating pattern diagram, we talk about the inputs, the PQRST. And when you look at PQRST, and the kind of layout that we're going to be looking for, what we need to do on the right-hand side is identify all of the activity areas. In other words, in your facility, in your large plant facility, a medium-sized plant facility, or small plant facility, you have areas in which activity is taking place. They could be called apartments if you want to be, you know, take it down. But you have to identify the activity areas based on the PQRST. Now the next step repeating pattern is what is the space relationship? What is the relationship between these activity areas and how much space is required? We'll be going through in a few minutes uh, a little diagram on how we rank relationships. And uh, those relationships will allow you to build a little pattern on a piece of paper. And that little pattern or that little diagram is going to be how your spaces should be placed in relationship to one another. Now, moving down to three, Adjustments for fit and function. If you have a long production line, a 40-foot long, 15-foot wide operation, you might not be able to change that appreciably in your new layout. So your preliminary layout is going to have to be put in, it's going to have to be laid out uh, to accommodate that long 40-foot line. Now, in the next one, maybe there can be some modifications to create some alternative layouts to the preliminary shown above. Maybe we can have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and so on and so forth. After we've got these alternative plans, we're going to rank them. We're going to evaluate them. We're going to, we're going to weight them. We're going to score them. And after we score them, we're going to pick the very best layout plan based on the weighting and the scoring system that we've put together. So I've got a, another slide that's a little bit more open, but it's basically saying the same thing. Up at the top, it says input data, PQRST. OK. Before we get a relationship diagram number three, we're going to drive it in two ways. We're going to drive it by the flow of materials and then activity relationships. What do I mean by activity relationships? Those number twos, those activity relationships that are non-flow related, okay? Let me go to the left side and say flow of materials says operation one and operation two should be side by side and, and not necessarily near, near operation three. But if we looked at the activity relationships, 
Operations one, two, and three share staff. Hmm. If they share staff, they should be close together. So what we have here is, is a combination of one plus two into a combination relationship diagram where we take into cons consideration both flow-related and non-flow-related items to get a relationship diagram that takes into consideration both. Now, we move to four. We need to determine the space requirements. We have a means to do that. We, we look at today's number five, space available, and we may take the, the, the existing space requirement, we may shrink the existing, or we may expand it, depending on what we see for future requirements. Now, I mentioned to you that we have of some little diagram things that we use. So we're going to take these spaces and we're going to create a relationship diagram with one and two side by side, three not necessarily, four doesn't have to be close to any of them, and so on and so forth. We're going to build a, a little space relationship diagram that depicts how our facility should be laid out relative to one another. Okay. Now, what comes into play are some modifying considerations, such as um, such as that forty-foot-long line that can't really be changed. We're going to have to deal with that. Um, we've got. We've got a relationship between two operations that says they cannot be near each other. Operation D emits an effluent that makes product C scrap. So we need to we need to deal with that. We can't have them side by side. Then on the other side, number eight, we may have some practical limitations. And I can think of practical limitations such as um, uh, uh, curing booths and heat treating ovens and paint booths and things like that where they need to be on a typically need to be on a wall where they could be vetted and so on and so forth and finally using our space relationship diagram with any modifying considerations and practical limitations we develop a couple of layout alternatives. Uh, plan A, Plan B, Plan C. Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C probably look somewhat alike, but there will be some subtle differences. And with those subtle differences, we can create a little evaluation chart. We can weight certain elements on that chart, and we can evaluate those layout alternatives, and finally zero in on the best and top-notch layout out of four, five, six. And you should have a number of alternatives to, to compare, if you will. So first step, the first major step in SLP uh, using the PQRST information is to determine the departments, the activity areas. And what's important about the activity area form, which I'll show you in a second here, is that you include all activities, everything. Be, be, be dogged, I mean, just dig include all activities, both manufacturing and non-manufacturing, that take place on your shop floor in certain locations. Okay? Now, if some of these activity areas are going to be reconfigured, you definitely need to know the PQRST, so that if you're going to put a cell in an area, you're going to have to know that kind of information anyways. This is a form developed by Richard Muther back at University of Kansas, probably in the 50s. And you can see it's uh, 
you know, 1950s form, can be easily made into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but a couple things that I want to emphasize about activity area data gathering. Uh, you really need to be uh, dogged on this. Um, you've got to look at the shapes of areas. Across the top where those slanted, li slanted thing lines are up there and you see some di diagrams in there, make sure you capture all of the special features. And you notice that in the physical features required, there's a couple of empty slots. You may need to expand this and have several empty slots because you, you, you may uh, uncover some things that you, you know. So, so if you have an activity area, let's say number one there, um, and the name of it is receiving, you identify the current square foot area of receiving, and then you go along the physical features list and you, you, you identify the various special features that you need to uh, take in. A very, very important part of this is a knee-jerk reaction would be to run down to engineering and get the plant drawing and do this from the plant drawing. Don't. Don't. Physically go out, walk Gemba, physically measure the current situation. Get the shape of the area. Get the footprint of the area. Get all the information, everything that's necessary, because this is going to be the baseline that drives your final, your final. So it's very important that these activity areas are defined in a uh, highly detailed way. And this form uh, is available through Richard Muther Associates, uh, and, and, many, and all of the forms that I'm going to be showing you are, are also available, but uh, many, many times um, they, they're easily converted to a, an Excel spreadsheet, if you will. So once you've developed the activity areas, the next step is we're going to generate some real data of material movement. This is the, the flow driver of your process. We're going we're gonna to develop a chart called the from to, and actually it's from to to from material flow chart. We're going to list the various operations, one, two, vertically, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, and across the top, one, two, three, four, five. Well, one to one, you can't, but you can go one to two, two to one, and so on and so forth. So I'll show you that in a second. Because we're going to be wanting to quantify something called the equivalent material moves between each activity area. And this is a little tricky. This is a little dicey part of the, uh, of the pr presentation and, and the learning. The equivalent standard, the equivalent standard is a four by four by four pallet. In other words, four by four pallet, four foot high. That's a common pallet equivalent. Okay. Now, if you're an electronic shop or a, a small plastic assembly shop, shop or something to that effect, maybe maybe you don't move four by four by fours. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Let me let me just relate something about the four by four. And the four by four by four, and how it can be a little, little bit tricky. Let's say you're a sheet metal house, and you order in some flat roll product, to cut to, to cut the size, and of course you can stack some uh, one by two by eight inch, right? Uh, sheet metal on a pallet, pretty pretty compact, right? And, and you you don't want to get that pallet too heavy because your forklift might not be able to lift it. So maybe that pallet is going to be four by four by two. So it's really a half a material equivalent as it comes in to receiving. And as it's transported to assembly, it could be still that half a pallet equivalent. But now, over in assembly, we have a brake press. And we convert that flat material into housing. Oh, wow, now 
those things that sat flat on the pallet and are now, now becoming little boxes, and you can't get that many of them on a pallet. So all of a sudden, when you go from assembly to inspection, right, you got lots of pallets going stacked fairly high. So you can see how, how, how the material equivalent can, in fact, uh, in some cases, balloon. When you're talking electronics, carts, trays, pallets, um, eh, carts and trays are probably more of the standard volume move in, in, in that kind of environment. So when I, when I look at this slide, okay, and I look at this slide, I say this is, a, this is one you need to asterisk to, to know when you get involved with doing this, your equivalent material is going to be probably different than the 4x4x4 four by four by four pallet. It could be something else, and you need to be very, um, you know, you need to be very careful how you how you get that. And then what you have is um, you notice one through thirteen down, and one through I'm sorry, one through fifteen down, and one through fifteen across. This is where you're going to actually collect the from to to from um, equivalent material moves between the two activity areas, <laughs> okay? And this will be the driver of whether two and three will be close to each other or two and three don't need to be next to each other, but two and ten need to be next to each other. You see what I'm saying? This is the material flow, material movement um, information that's going to drive the closeness of operations based on uh, flow. Now, this is, got, this is a fun one. This is a fun one. We're going to look at a chart in a minute that's going to make you dizzy, make you a little dizzy. We're going to look at here a non-flow relationship chart. We're going to identify and rate non-flow relationships, such as sharing supervision, inspection equipment shared, need compressed air, lifting equipment, what have you, staffing needs, staffing shares, uh, power requirements, and so on and so forth. So this little chart here has, uh, first of all, I'm going to point this out. It has this little chart right here where my arrow's around it, and it's going to talk about um, the importance of two departments or two areas being close to, together. A, E, I, O, U, X, always next to each other especially important to be next to each other. It's important, ordinary importance. It is unnecessary for the two to be side by side. And last but not least, they cannot be side by side. It's an X a factor. It's, it's, it's a no. It could be, could be safety. It could be contaminants and what have you. And when you rank an A, you need to have a set of reasons down here. Or you rank an E, you need a set of reasons. So you'll notice up here, comparing one and two near each other, always near each other for reason number two, which, by the way, is not defined down here. It could be um, uh, ventilation, ventilation, uh, whatever. But you notice one and two. Let's let's look at one and four. One and four. It would be in this box right here. It would be in this box. One, four. So you can see how you can get a little bit queasy looking at this chart, but this is allowing you to define non-flow reasons for two areas to be side by side. Now, what are you going to do with this? What you're going to do with is it, you're going to take and develop a combined flow, non-flow relationship chart. You're going to take the flow relationship and the non-flow relationship, and you're going to create a combined chart. One thing you, you need to understand about this is we're going to be using the 80-20 rule. A's and E's, A-E-I-O-U, A's and E's next to each other all the time. 
and that this combination flow non flow relationship will drive the ultimate square block diagram the square block diagram you'll see that in a minute so really quick and and this this is this is team based scoring so it's it's not really important ultimately uh, a relationship takes into percent it's 60% an E relationship takes in between 60 and 80, 60 to 80 combined. An I adds another 10% up to 90%. The O adds another 10% so that you get your 80% and your 20%. Okay, 80, so 80% is going to be driven close together where they need to be, and you're going to get and, and the scoring is a weighting uh, with letter relationships, okay? And, and it's hard to explain this thing, but, but anyways, um, I'll see if I can go there. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the non-flow relationship and the flow relationship, and we're going to take the activity pair, one, two. The flow rating was A, uh, I forget what, A2 or A3. Um, the non-flow rating was uh, A, um, I'm sorry, A6, A6, so combined is A12, okay? So, so, you, so you have, a, let's say you have a, a relationship here that says um, um, A6, X minus 10. The combined is a minus 4. You've got, a rela you've got a minus four over here. So this is a situation where you're not going to have those two together. Okay? So here we are taking into consideration the combination, the combination of material flow and non-material flow. And the combined flow is, is an 80-20 rule, okay? you got The material flow, you get equivalent moves times 0.6 is an A relationship. Equivalent moves times 0.2 is an E relationship. Equivalent moves times 0.1 is an I relationship. Equivalent moves times uh, 0.1 is an O relationship. Then you have a unnecessary, and then you have an absolutely never. And you have always A's and E's will be adjacent to each other. You notice we have some team-based scoring. Here we have some points over here. Okay? And we have some totals over here. Okay. So this is going to be a combination and you want to get your cumulative pointing points over here. Now let me go to the next one. The next most important step is to get space requirements. And in a chart, I'll show you in a second, each activity area will be defined as the current space. Get well. It could be up or it could be down. Or a future where we see much more business or maybe no business. But the systematic layout planning process step to determine space requirements is this chart here. An activity area, what is it now, and so on and so forth. The gathering of information about the space requirements. Now, I'm going to take all the information that we've gathered. We're going to create a space relationship diagram, okay? And we're going to start to diagram. We're going to start putting these, these relationships together into a, a chart form. This is the chart that drives it. The A E I O U X. What is it? Absolutely necessary, especially important, and so on and so forth. Now we can have some line codes. The A's are four lines. The E's are three lines. The I's are two lines. The O's are one line. Unimportant is zero. Undesirable is the jagged sawtooth. We may wait this. We may wait this, okay? 
with numerical weights d d defined by our team. So here's we, what we have. Here's what we have. We have the credit department in relationship to uh, department two, toy department. It's important, and it's got a weighting of six. It's got a square area of 100. The toy department, with respect to number three, which is the wine department, it's unimportant. So what we've got here is the latter is the closeness rating, and the number is the reason for the rating. Okay, how close, and why? Now we go to the next one. We've got all these relationships together now, and we've got our, our, our initial relationship. You notice that the boxes, one, two, three, four, five, are all the same size. Why? Because all I've done here is create a relationship. One and four, E relationship. Two and five, an A relationship. Two and four, uh, uh, an I relationship, a three and five, U, an X relationship, and a four and five, an X relationship. So this is nothing more than the relationship diagram. You could, if you had this on a transparent, you could lay this out on top of the plant and come up with a block level diagram based upon the space relationship and the space needed from the relationship diagram I just showed you. And I'll move that right into the space relationship diagram. Here's what I just showed you. This is the initial layout compared based on the little square blocks with the, with the for three lines, four lines, two lines, one line. But the final line is based on what does the square footage of the building really accommodate. Well, yeah, two is a big, long, skinny thing. Three's short and fat, and five, one, and four are, in fact, uh, pretty equal in size. There may be two or three alternatives in here compared to this one, but number two, number three, number four, and this is the final layout. What we need to do with that is to put it into an alternative evaluating chart where we weight Reduced material handling, shorter throughput time, fewer spot shortages, uh, better quality, and we weight these. We take the A times the weight, and we multiply those numbers out. A, I forget, I think, um, was has a 2. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, a 4. 4 times 8 is 32. Uh, this was an I relationship, which is 2 times 8 is 16. And then you've got all these items for uh, option A, option B, option C. And if you go down the very bottom, you add up the total of these numbers. And the highest score will be your best plant layout. Okay? I know we're going through a lot quite fast. Now, the next thing you need to do real quick is to create a detailed facility layout. Uh, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, the old-fashioned way is to cut out your paper dolls and get a vellum layout of the facility and move these little machine footprints, um, whatever footprints, into the various area work them around. Another, another way, of course, is to use CAD. Um, some people don't like CAD because it, sometimes the CAD operator takes a lot of um, freedom. But um, the, you know the old the old uh, mylar grid with paper dolls is still a viable way of, of doing your final equipment layout. I provided this slide as the final slide. This is a summary of everything we've talked about today. Okay, from the four phases to the three. Uh, the three steps, if you will, the three, and the various diagrams, the four lines, and what have you. So this is a, a capsule summary of what we've talked about today. A couple things about resources for you folks. Um, I can talk in, from, from the New England 
manufacturing extension partnerships. Uh, Mass, New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, Rhode Island, and Connecticut all have trained, certified um, SLP people. Okay. I already talked to Richard Muther and Associates, and they were very much in favor of what I've done here today. And they pro provide consulting and training services in this in this process. So. Uh, in that, this is my last slide and a conclusion, and, I, and I'd less, like to have some time for some questions. Jerry, are you there? Hello? Thank you, Dave. OK. <laughs> and now we will review any questions. If you do have any questions for Dave, please submit them on the right side of your screen, and I will read them. And actually, we did have one that came in while you were on the um, relationship chart. And the yes. question was, can you explain again the relationship chart? And then in friends, they have 13R by 15C. Perhaps use an example. Um, if this was the non-flow relationship chart, it's it's basically um, scoring how two activity areas need to be near each other or not near each other based on some factor, some reason. And, uh, and 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 you're basically using the A E I O U relationship, you know, always close to each other or never close to each other, and then a reason why that should be. I think that's what the question is about. It's, is that uh, that that relationship diagram? Okay, great, thanks. And there's a couple of questions, um, and these I can answer. But uh, the questions are, will the PowerPoint presentation be made available to the attendees and uh, you know, have access to the slides? And, and yes, uh, Dave has um, agreed to send us a PDF of the presentation. And that we will be sending along with the recorded link for this webinar uh, later on this week. So um, that's great. And then another question is, what size facility is SLP suited for? OK. Um, SLP, a, a full-blown SLP, probably is a multi-month project. <laughs> Not probably. is a multi-month project. Um, probably in the vicinity of 10 to 12 uh, consulting days. Um, and it's most suited for the large job. If you're going to be relaying out a 50,000 square foot plant facility, that would be a full SLP and be more than justified. Conversely, if you're going to be laying out a smaller office complex or a warehouse or, or, a, or a small set of departments, SSLP or simplified systematic layout planning may be the preferred uh, technique because it's not as big and big and complicated as the 50,000 plus square foot facility. OK, great. Um, another question is, how do we plan for a packing area that has been fed by multiple suppliers at different rates? That's that's an that's a very interesting question. Um, I guess you really need to know uh, really need to know um, how much is coming in and look at the worst case scenario. Let's say all five suppliers ship in their max amounts at the same day, the same moment. How much space would be required? And um, and then then look at the very best and then come up with some kind of an interim. Um, but that's a space. That's going to be a space requirement kind of scenario, because right, obviously, to, you, obviously, you get buried. Right. And to follow up on that, um, how do we better plan the pathways for delivery processes, such as kitting, 
from a centralized store. Kidding and oh, uh, 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 scheduling uh, kidding to uh, some 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 other location. Is that the question? Uh, I believe so. Let me repeat it again. How yeah. do we better plan the pathways for delivery processes such as kidding from a centralized store? That really, that to me almost sounds like a, a, a lean question, um, using some form of uh, FIFO lanes or something like that to, uh, you know, um, create a pull system so that you're not overloading. You're delivering just what you need when you need it. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. And we have another uh, question. What significant adjustments to SLP might be made if considering a retrofit to a facility? That's a that's a really good question because most of the things that I've seen have been retrofits. And uh, in other words, a company making a decision that the current layout is is not suitable anymore. We've, we've got to change. And um, I think the, the I think that one chart there, when we're looking at space requirements, space requirements, um, you know, actual, um, future, um, expansion, whatever. But, um, you know, really, really spending a, a, a good amount of time, an honest time, on that chart to come up with the space requirements for the new retrofit. OK. Great. Great. And then uh, one other question, looks like our last question. Um, is SLP solely driven by material movement? No, as we, we talked about during the session, no, it's not. Um, and you know, as you go through depending on the kind of facility you've got um, you may have you may have non-flow um, items actually driving the layout um, but like I said in this particular little presentation I, I, I portrayed both both the material moves equivalent material moves which is the flow driver and I showed also the non-material uh, drivers uh, such as shared supervision and so on and so forth and then the combined both material and non-flow uh, that's the beauty of this process it's that the beauty of this process is it takes in all drivers okay great um, I don't see any more questions so Again, thank you, uh, everyone, for your questions. We appreciate them. And thank you, Dave, for a very insightful presentation. This brings our webinar to a close. Our next webinar is scheduled for January 22nd on how lean can reach its potential with Robert Doc Hall, Monique Dome, and Jack Ward. Please visit AME.org under AME Events and Training for more information and to register. And don't forget to fill out the short survey that will be in your inbox. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a productive day.